Hey everybody, welcome once again to the Winning Digital Customers live cast. We've got a really cool topic today. I wanna to talk about things that are going away and what you are going to need to do about it. So first of all, what do I mean when I say things are going away? Well, we've gotten a lot of cool new things in our lives over the last few years, whether it's drones, Alexas, Apple Watches, and of course, if you look farther back in the calendar, you've got broadband internet, you've got uh, smartphones, of course, a wide range of new innovative ways of accomplishing things we need to do in our lives, whether that's shopping or banking or dating or whatever it may be. So that's fantastic. But you know, whenever we have these new solutions, inevitably there are some things that are displaced. And there are a variety of technologies or, or other things that used to be part of daily life and which frankly are just obsolete. They're no longer needed. And so what we're gonna talk about today is how can we think about and plan for what are some things that are part of our lives today but are becoming obsolete? But, but before we do, just to underscore this point that things do eventually go away, such as the Telegraph, the Rolodex, the old phone booth, remember that? Where will Superman change now, right? Of course, the VHS tape. And, and I wanna clarify one thing. When I say things are going away, are there still VHS tapes in the world? Yeah, somewhere or other. Maybe there's even still a phone booth somewhere. I don't know. It could have a, 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 a fence around it so that nobody touches it since it's an artifact, you know? Many times, things that we would say have essentially gone away still exist at some very, very small niche level. Somebody out there is still playing VHS videotapes, but let's face it, the VHS videotape is no longer a part of main, mainstream media, no longer a part of business today in any significant way. And that's what I mean when I say something has gone away. There's somebody out there still using a roll of Kodak, Kodak film, and there's probably somewhere still walking around with a pager, but compared to where these things were at their peak, when they were a major mainstream parts of the technology of daily life to today when they are tiny niche, nostalgic, um, whatever you wanna call them, you know, technologies or solutions. This is what I mean when I say something has essentially gone away. Again, you may find a yellow page somewhere, somewhere out there still as a typewriter, but good luck if you wanna buy a typewriter. <laughs> There's probably some typewriters.com still probably sells typewriters, but generally speaking, these things have been supplanted by more, well, by newer technologies. And we'll talk in a minute about what it takes to for something to take the place of an existing solution. But, um, you know, one of the things that triggered me wanting to do this live cast was a live cast that I did um, a month or two ago, maybe. And I talked about my prediction that books are going away. Essentially that eBooks over the next 10 to 20 years are going to rise to the point where the physical printed book is, let's just call it kind of an outlier, something that I'm not saying it won't exist anywhere. There are still stone tablets that are chiseled occasionally. There are still scrolls that someone writes on occasionally, but for all practical day-to-day -day intensive purposes, uh, the book will cease to be. And I got a ton of people disagreeing with me, people saying, no, no, I love my books. And of course it is true that whenever we have a, a, a technology which is being sunset, there's always people who feel emotional or nostalgic about that old uh, sunsetting technology. Um, if you wanna watch, I'll put a note, I'll put the link in the, in the notes for this. If you wanna watch that, I go into great detail about my prediction that books are going away, some stats behind it, and a great number of details about why it is that I believe books are going away. Uh, but we're not here today to talk about books. Instead on this one, I'm gonna not try to talk about one technology, if you wanna call books a technology at length, but rather, the goal here is going to be to go through a variety of things that I believe are going away so you can see if you agree with me or disagree with me and then consider if you think that there's a likelihood that what I'm saying is true, what you may or may not need to do to prepare. And by the way, one of the ways in which I assess whether technology is likely to be flatlining, going up or going down is a model which is described in my book, Winning Digital Customers, The Antidote to Irrelevance. Our research has shown that, that uh, new technologies or new channels or media or websites or apps or whatever it may be that supplants old ones, it tends to be because they dominate or, or improve in one or more of these areas and very often in all three of them. And the three areas are hyper-convenience, 
proactive personalization, and massive value shift. In other words, new solutions tend to be more convenient, less expensive, or in some other way, creating more value, and more personalized. Take something like Skype, supplanting the traditional long distance call. It is certainly a, a massive value shift without question, right? You used to have to pay two, three, four, five, sometimes more dollars per minute to speak to someone somewhere else around the world. Now it's down to pennies or in many cases free. Uh, it does have more personalization. You can, for example, uh, create your lists of all the people that you, you speak to regularly and reach them with just a click without having to know their phone numbers. And, um, you know, I would argue that it is more convenient because instead of needing to find a phone, you can do it from your smartphone, you can do it from your tablet, you can do it from your computer. You know, you don't have to be home to make a call using your own Skype context. So Skype has improved upon traditional long distance by being more convenient, more personalized, and frankly, just plain old cheaper. And that is the key usually to things that supplant an older technology. So what we're going to talk about today is not, uh, uh, you know, magical, mystical foretelling the future. Um, and by the way, you know, I can never be certain about any of these predictions. All I can do is look at trends of what typically results in something being sunset as something that is going away, shall we say, and try to give you my prediction. So, you know, a little like the weatherman who can tell you there's a, an 80 percent chance of rain or sometimes I love when they tell you there's a 50 percent chance of rain. Right. Because then they're going to be right either way. In any case, I'm not trying to um, uh, skirt my responsibility for accurate predictions here. Uh, but I do want to, uh, so as I go through these items, I'm going to give you my a gauge on the probability. This is not a scientifically derived probability, but it's, uh, you know, to what degree I think this is a certainty or to what degree I think there's some likelihood, but not necessarily an absolute certainty that this particular thing is going to be going away. But, but I'd also just want to point out that even though I'm going to be going through things that are going away, everything is not going away. There's lots of things that aren't going anywhere. It is not my prediction. And my, my time horizon, by the way, that I'm going to be talking about here is the next 20 years. I'm going to tee that up in a moment. 20 years from now, Howard predicts we will still have wrenches. We will still have faucets. We will still drive cars. We will still have refrigerators in our homes. Of course, they may be newer, cooler versions of these things. The car, of course, might be electric. The refrigerator might I don't know, do all kinds of cool things that refrigerators can't do today. But fundamentally, uh, we are not replacing the car with some completely different mode of transportation or the refrigerator, et cetera. The way, for example, that the icebox, the pre-existing, the precursor to the refrigerator, which was a non-electric appliance into which you slid a large giant block of ice to keep your food cold. And every few days, a delivery man would show up and replace that giant block of ice. This would have been like in the 1910s or you know, 19, early 1920s. Uh, because, of course, uh, that at one time was extremely popular and a major industry of companies having to deliver all that ice to people's homes. Today, of course, nobody does it that way. That has gone away. And we now have electric refrigerators in nearly every home in this country and probably in many countries around the world. So what we're going to talk about today, my, what I've teed up for you here are 20 things that are going away over the course of the next 20 years. However, we are going to be breaking this into two parts because I want to cover 10 parts today, and then I will do another live cast where I cover parts 11 through 20 just for time because we want to be able to spend at least a couple minutes on each of these things, and you know we won't be able to do it in our usual time limit of a live cast if we uh, try to cover all 20. So 10 today and 10. By the way, while I have my second 10, my number 11 through 20, I would love to hear in the show notes, <coughs> sorry, I would love to hear in the uh, comments. First of all, if you disagree with any of the items that I've put in this list of 10 that I'm about to begin going over, and also what else you think belongs on this list. Because if I hear some great feedback from you guys about things that belong on the list, I still have the opportunity to uh, demote some from my second half of the list and put some even better ones in there. So I've got some good ones for you today, some good ones for next time, but I'm still, I'm still listening. If someone has uh, something that you think is going away in the next 20 years, and you know, 20 years is a long time. Think about it like this. Where were we 20 years ago? 20 years ago, there was no, no iPhone. That was before the iPhone came out. There might have been some very early smartphones like the, the Trio, if you remember, the was it from Palm or Kyocera? I can't remember. But anyway, very, very early versions of the smartphone. The idea of video to your phone was just kind of this uh, notion. Uh, the content that we were delivering to phones was mostly like text messages sending you weather. 
And I was probably at that time still walking around with an alphanumeric pager. So 20 years can be quite a long time. And uh, so 20 years from now, we could see quite a lot of change. Okay, with that, no more teeing up, no more pussyfooting. We're going to get into the first 10 of the 20 things that are going away in the next 20 years. Now, I'm going to start with a couple of easy, non-controversial ones just to get you warmed up. And then I'm going to get you mad. <laughs> no. Don't worry. Puppy dogs are not going away in the next 20 years, I promise. But fax machines are. And in fact, that's such an easy one. You might even argue, Howard, come on, aren't they pretty much already gone? Well, after all, if you look at this graph, this shows the decline in the sales of fax machines in the United States. This only goes even through 2010. And at that point, it was less than one-tenth of its peak. So clearly, fax machines have been dying for quite a long time. And yet, it was only last week that my wife, who is a psychologist, and it winds up dealing with a lot of insurance companies, had something that she was required to fax to, I won't say their name, just out of politeness, but to fax to one of the large health insurance companies regarding one of her patients. And no, she couldn't email it, and no, she couldn't mail it. It had to be faxed. <laughs> and she's like, do we even have a device in our house that can still send a fax? So fax machines are still hanging on by their fingernails, mostly due to uh, resistance to change. But uh, I remember when I first got one of my first jobs, I was working for BMI Music, it's probably 20 years old, as like a temp, helping out in uh, doing stuff for the people that were producing records there. And my job was to send faxes. And I remember having to send faxes to MTV regarding music videos for artists like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I remember sending the fax and I hadn't made sure the pages were like completely straight going through the fax machine. So I guess MTV had gotten the pages and they were like just a tiny bit crooked and I got in big trouble. I almost lost my job for not properly operating the fax machine. So they were hugely important to business at one time. Today, they're pretty marginal, but I'm going to give this oops, I'm going to give this a 100 percent probability that 20 years from now, these things will have gone the way of the telex. There will be no more fax machines except at the Smithsonian or, you know, one old person down the block that's still keeping their fax machine. But that is it. Fax machines are toast in the next 20 years. OK, now let's move on to one that I'm 90 percent sure about, which is landline telephones. We've seen, of course, over the years, the decline of the landline telephone already. Back in 2004, not that long ago, the uh, over 90% of all homes in the U.S. had landlines. Today, it is only 36.7%. And if you follow that line down, because you can see it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, straight line, right? You follow that line down, there's no question that even within 10 years, the existence of landlines Will be, will be marginal. And I think certainly safe to say, in fact, my 90% may even be a little bit conservative, that within 20 years, we will no longer see any kind of traditional landline in the home. And you know, by the way, you might ask yourself, well, what do I care? What does it matter to me? Well, of course, if you're in the landline business, it matters a lot. And those people are probably already paying attention to these statistics. And I don't know what your business is, but whatever it is, to the degree you depend on fax machines or landlines, and again, we're gonna to get to some more controversial stuff in a minute, it means that you need to be starting to think about how to go through some kind of digital transformation, how to be ready for what's next, how to not to stick with uh, you know, this, these sunsetting technologies. And no doubt you're gonna to wanna to transition off them long before 20 years from now. In fact, these are two technologies you probably wanna be moving away from right now or perhaps already have. There are many, far superior digital telephony systems, for example, that give you all kinds of flexibility as people are working from home, voice over IP, et cetera, so you're not relying on landlines. Let's move on to some more, perhaps uh, less obvious stuff. Television channels, number three on my list. By 20 years from now, I predict the complete elimination of the idea of the television channel. Now, what is a television channel? Well, a cable or regular broadcast channel says, this brand, NBC or Disney or whatever it is, we're going to have this linear programming where there's something showing at 9 a.m. and there's something else at 10 a.m. and then there's a half hour program from 10 to 1030 and then there's another one. That's what I mean by a television channel. Of course, we're still going to consume video content on our phones and on our homes, but it's all going to be on demand. And we will no longer see this notion that we have to have this grid of all these different brands. Those same brands may be sending you that content but you won't be doing it with these kinds of time blocks. Of course, the cable industry has been talking about this for years, the concept of cord cutting. I remember this was, I was really first introduced to this idea. 
I remember I taught a class at NYU, and this was a class, this was in the School of the Arts in the Interactive Telecommunication Program, and this was probably almost, let's say, 15 years ago. And the course was called Internet Television. The course was about the intersection between the world of digital and the world of traditional media. And so this was a course about television. And I remember one of the questions I asked the first day of class, and we were going around the room. It was a graduate school class, so there are probably, I don't know, no more than 20, 22 uh, students in the class. And I asked something about, we we're talking about television, you know, what do you watch on television or something like that, as one of the icebreaker questions to hear and learn a little bit more about the students. And I was shocked to see that half of the students in that room 15 years ago did not have a television and did not have any kind of cable television access. They were watching stuff uh, on their laptops, videos on, you know, off of iTunes and whatnot. This was a class about television and half of the students did not have a traditional television and did not have cable. Now, of course, these were college students. So at the time you wouldn't have seen that same level of um, cord cutting, which means getting rid of your traditional cable uh, access in, uh, in a sort of a suburban home. This was kids who were college students living in that transitory part of their lives probably most of them, you know, limited, limited budgets, et cetera. But nevertheless, I think it says a lot that uh, even back then we were starting to see this trend. And if we look at the trend now, this shows you, this is the number of households in the United States that have access to what I'm talking about, linear television, meaning not Netflix, but ch channels of television. And you can see how it peaked around 2010. Uh, that was even a little after I was teaching that class and had that experience. And it's been on the decline ever since. And I think we can expect that that decline will continue. So that's my item number three, uh, the elimination within 20 years of the television channel. And while we're at it, I'm gonna throw a few more video things in here real quick. Number four, the television remote, the remote control. Now, remote controls are not only used for linear television, of course. You have, you know, in my house, we have what we call the Netflix remote, which is actually the remote for the TV that lets us access Netflix and other on-demand services, but through the smart TV. But uh, even those remotes, I'm going to predict that 20 years from now, we will not have remote control devices. Because let's be honest, they're a pain in the butt because you keep losing them. You got to always figure out who's got the remote control. You fight over the remote control. So a lot of negative experiences associated with remote controls. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not predicting we're going to go back to life before the remote control where, God forbid, in order to change the channel, you had to get up out of your seat and walk up to the television and actually push the button on the television in order to change the channel. We will never go back to that barbaric time. But I think that a combination of smartphone apps, which already exist for almost every television platform, which allows you to control your television, in addition to voice control, will really be the way in which we interact with our televisions. And possibly these large screens at our homes eventually will become touch screens. So in some cases, maybe we will walk up and interact with them. But I think mostly we'll see voice commands. You know, Picard on the Star Trek never uh, went up to a, a, a remote control or a keyboard to interact with his big screen, you know, computer, show me the nebula galaxy or whatever he would say. So I think we're already seeing, of course, the voice capabilities being built in to many remote control devices. I think what we can expect is next generation smart TVs, and many already do have this built in, and also you know, Google Home and Alexa and these other home control systems will have speakers throughout the house so that if you wanna change the channel, you'll simply speak your intention and it will happen. And you won't need to look through the couch uh, cushions for your remote control anymore. And of course, that's a good way to find a few extra bucks and change. So, uh, you know, that's the downside, I guess. So that is prediction number four for today. 90% likelihood that 20 years from now, a remote control of any sort will be a thing of the past. All right. And number five, those screens on airplanes in front of you. I think uh, those are already starting to disappear. I see brand new planes being purchased by, I mostly fly United Airlines, many of which no longer have those screens because they realize that so many customers are carrying screens with them, iPads, computers, and other things that they can connect to the plane's Wi-Fi network that it just isn't worthwhile. In fact, I love this picture because this is obviously an old picture. It actually has one of those um, air phones. You know, you remember years ago, uh, planes also had those little telephones where you could make kind of the equivalent of a satellite cellular call, crazy expensive. I, I probably used them a couple of times in my life. Never really seemed worth the, the cost. It was like 10 bucks a minute. But of course, we've already seen those go away. I haven't seen those in years. Those have already been removed from airplanes. And I think that uh, 
airlines increasingly will just decide that there's just not enough value. You know, I remember being a kid. And if you remember back then when you'd fly in an airplane, there was music, there were cha different channels of music that you could listen to. And they'd give you these headphones that were sort of like tubes. They weren't even wire electronic. They were just like, like tubes that would go in your ears. And then there'd be this like plug with the two tubes that would plug into the seat jacket. And I guess the, um, uh, the seat, the seat armrest, and I guess the um, the actual speaker was in there, and uh, they could sanitize those. Anyway, it was a big deal to be able to sit down on an airplane and see, oh, I've got 10 channels of music. Do I want to listen to rock or classical or news? Of course, all gone, no longer exists. And similarly, I think we're going to see the seatback entertainment consoles simply replaced by what already exists, which is on-demand entertainment, which you connect to via Wi-Fi and which is available on your own personal device. Okay, number six, maybe this is a more controversial one, but one that I think is going to improve all of our lives. 80% probability that 20 years from now, there will be no more lines, right? No waiting in line. What a stupid way to determine uh, who, sorry about the ring in there. What a stupid way to determine who gets served next, whether it's to buy tickets or to get food or whatever you may do, be doing, than to make human beings actually put their physical bodies in a row in order to know who's, who's got the next. You know, this problem was solved 50 years ago by those little take a ticket numbers at a deli counter, right? And yet we still continue to see a, a wide range of different applications, whether it's checking out at a supermarket or buying things at Macy's or getting your movie tickets or, or lining up to get into a stadium or going to a theme park. Lines have continued to be a, a big part of uh, many different types of consumer experiences, and rarely are they a positive experience. Theme parks have tried for years to make waiting in line more fun and interesting by putting different you know, things to look at and videos playing. But let's face it, you're stuck in line. And not only that, it's almost always bad for whatever business is putting you in line that they're making you wait in line. I mean, just think, the time I could spend at the grocery store, the time I spend waiting in line, I could, be I could be shopping. I could be spending that time buying something else instead of waiting in line. Certainly the time I spend at a theme park is time I could be you know, eating another, uh, another Zeppeli or buying another drink, again, instead of waiting in line. And in fact, you know, Disney, uh, it's been a number of years already that since they introduced technology that massively reduces lines by letting people digitally queue using the Disney Magic Band. You, you indicate, you know, this is a ride I want to go on, and it gives you a time slot to come back, and then you can do whatever you want. You can go get some food, you can go shopping, you can go on another ride, come back during your time window, and once again, you, you wave your Magic Band, which is an RFID sensor, and it knows that you were in line for that particular time slot, and it lets you in. So the line is a virtual line, a digital line, if you will, that allows you to be physically free rather than having to stand there and, and go through the, uh, the, the maze, the rat maze, right, of a theme park. Um, but of course, we don't see this just today in theme parks. Uh, we see it, for example, with uh, restaurants. Instead of queuing up or waiting or even having to wait, even if you're not in line, waiting around, the, you know, that old thing where you get on the list with the, with the reservationist, the, the person taking the reservations at the restaurant, then you kind of have to hang out and wait for them to call your name. Of course, now most of us have had this experience where they simply text you. And uh, we see this in, uh, in, in a wide range of different areas now where you can, between texting and other messages of notification, no longer needing to have people wait in line. And of course, Amazon Go has famously been working on eliminating the need to check out in stores. And an Amazon Go store, you may very well know this, it's just kind of a small grocery store, convenience store type model. You scan your phone on the way in, just get whatever you want. They use optical uh, image recognition, video recognition to see, watch you essentially, and see which items you've taken off the shelves. You can just grab whatever you want, walk out the door, and they're just going to charge you for whatever you've taken. <coughs> no need to wait in any lines, and in fact, no need for a checkout experience either. So I think with all of these technologies, we're going to see the elimination of the idea of waiting in line. So why don't you be first with your business? Well, not first. You can't. It's too late to be first. But why don't you move forward quickly on that in your business, rather than being the ones that are continuing to require waiting in line while others are not? Because, you know, when you're first to solve a point of pain, it creates customer delight. Wow. Here's one store that's not making me wait in line. This is so cool. I love you guys. But when you get past a certain point, when a certain number of locations are, are creating a new convenience and you're not, it goes from the opportunity to create delight 
to you're starting to annoy your customer because you're still requiring them to do that thing. Like custom, like 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 health insurance companies that still make my wife fax things to them, or places that make you fill out paper forms. And as you as you are no longer, you know, as, as you are becoming uh, a part of a minority that's requiring that, you're creating customer dissatisfaction, reducing customer preference, and eventually, when you eliminate it, instead of getting any customer delight you get just a reduction in customer pain and perhaps a feeling like, you know, it's about time. So on some of these things that are fairly certain to happen, I say, jump in early. Okay, number seven of the 10 we're gonna cover today, paper tickets, 70% probability from my perspective. Again, I'm looking at that going, maybe that's even too conservative, considering we're talking about in the next 20 years, that we will eliminate paper tickets. Now, of course, for travel, paper tickets have already been largely eliminated. Uh, globally, uh, digital ticketing, which includes travel and other things, is going to be over 33.8 billion tickets globally in 2023, according to Juniper Research, and I trust those guys. And that's up from 20.8 billion in 2021. So just from 2021 to 2023, we're going to see more than a 50% increase in the number of digital tickets. And of course, that's not mostly coming from travel because let's face it, travel was already heavily digital. So that means a lot of other types of ticketing other than your airplane e-ticket are gonna go digital. Let's talk about Disney again, your theme park uh, ticket from Disney, in addition, separate from the ride uh, waiting that we were talking about, can be done digitally. So you can get into the theme park using your phone. You don't need a physical ticket. And, uh, and um, we see this in a lot of places. A ticket master is now increasingly doing the, your ticket is your phone. So if you're going to a sports game or you're going to a concert, they're increasingly pushing digital tickets through QR code scanning. And of course, we're going to see that move more into near field communications as well. But in any case, the main point is you're using your phone device to give you entry into whatever you've bought a ticket to rather than anything on paper. That reduces fraud. That means that if you buy a ticket at the last minute, they don't have to worry about how to get it to you. You don't have to wait a wait in line, again, at the will call window to get your physical tickets. They don't have to worry about someone leaving and handing their ticket to someone else because you know, you're not gonna give your phone to someone else. A lot of reasons. New Jersey Transit, by me, commuting into the city. Train tickets are heavily digital now. And in fact, I was recently at the New York State Fair uh, at the Meadowlands, definitely not what you call a high tech event. This is one of those things where you buy funnel cakes and they have the high diving guy, you know, who climbs up the ladder and dives into the little thing of water. So this is like a like a hundred year old tradition, right? There's not much about the New Jersey State Fair that you'd call new or high tech. This is a nostalgic experience of Ferris wheels and funnel cakes. And yet this year at the New Jersey State Fair, perhaps in part pushed forward by COVID, you couldn't have a physical ticket. The only type of ticket accepted at the New Jersey State Fair this year is the old, my phone is my ticket. So this is a trend that I think is going to continue and it's probably, it's already substantial. And in the coming years, we're gonna see just everyone who's still a holdout being reduced, reduced, reduced to the point that the idea of needing a piece of paper or cardboard to get into an event or to, or to travel is gonna seem like a complete anachronism and will be gone, certainly within the next 20 years, probably much sooner. All right, we are rounding the home stretch for today's list of, of the first 10 of 20 things that are going away in the next 20 years. Number eight is toll booths, toll booths. Now, uh, I remember the book went from when I was a kid, The Phantom Toll Booth, fantastic kid's story. I hope kids will still read it in the future, but someone's gonna have to explain to those kids what the heck is a toll booth. That's okay. I mean, I remember when I was a kid reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I was like, what's a wardrobe? You know, and they had to explain to me, well, before there were closets, there were wardrobes. So in any case, so I, I have hopes that that book will still continue. But uh, the reality is that there's already been, of course, a huge push over the last couple of decades to have electronic, to electronic payment of tolls for bridges and roads and things like that. It's a little bit similar to our ticketing situation, a little bit different as well, though, as it often involves a special dedicated device. Here in the tri-state area, they're called easy passes. Wherever you live, there's probably some sort of little box that you get, you put in your car or you put it on your license plate, and that's how they know that you've gone through the, the, the toll gate and they can charge you the correct amount. And of course, there's many conveniences, speaking of hyper convenience for the customer, because it means you generally don't have to queue up in your car, you can go more quickly 
through the uh, toll. And uh, it's also has a, a value shift because usually they're able to charge you less for your toll because they have eliminated some of the costs of all the people that would normally have to take your money, not to mention all the mon uh, costs associated with handling all of that money. So, um, and now of course we're seeing, and this is not even new either, but is uh, being further proliferated we're seeing the, uh, the, the uh, expansion of these kind of, I'm not even sure what the word for them is, but instead of even going through a toll booth, there's simply sensors across the top of the road where you don't have to slow down at all. You simply continue to drive your car at full speed, 50, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, however <laughs> fast you drive your car. And uh, it is able to simply detect that you've passed that checkpoint and appropriately charge you for the use of the road. Um, so this is another uh, example where uh, it's already underway, but of course there still are toll booth operators. But I have to say, just yesterday I drove my son into New York City and I saw for the first time that in, at the George Washington Bridge crossing, they appear, at least in the, in the spur that I was on, to have eliminated even the physical payment booths and they have either easy pass or pay by mail. So for the relatively small percentage of people who go through that uh, toll, toll and don't have an easy pass device, it scans their uh, license plate and it sends them a, a bill in the mail. And that way they can completely eliminate the need for anybody to be standing there at a toll booth taking your money. And while on the one hand, it seems a little sad because of the jobs elimination uh, between you and me. And I mean, let's be honest, those are pretty bad jobs sitting there uh, breathing in car exhaust all day long. So hopefully those people can find better jobs. And meantime, uh, there's a lot of cost savings and increased efficiency associated with the ability to, uh, to have electronic tolls. So, that was that prediction, the elimination of any kind of traditional toll booth within 20 years. We're rounding the home stretch here. You can see why we had to break this into two parts. Number nine, parking meters. Now, this might be a little bit more controversial, but in the same vein as the eliminating, elimination of toll booths, parking meters have become more digitally savvy over the last number of years where you can use credit cards and many places, instead of having a separate payment meter at each location, they're able to have just one on each block almost like an ATM machine where you go get a ticket, put it in your car. But I believe that even that will be unnecessary. You could argue that that is already exampling, uh, an example of the elimination of parking meters because it's not really a meter. But I think it's going to go even farther to the point where we can simply use our phone, scan a QR code that may be embedded into the sidewalk or something like that, and pay with, with uh, Venmo or something like that for our, for our parking uh, on the street. Um, or in the future, it may be that smarter cars have the technology in them to simply interact with uh, whatever metering system it is and pay for our parking, hopefully prevent us from getting a ticket and eliminate the need for all of those ugly metal boxes, eliminate the need for people who have to go around and collect the stuff from them and everything and eliminate the need for us to have to worry about carrying change or dealing with, uh, you know, going through a payment process every time we park our cars. Okay, we are to number 10, which is keys, keys. My prediction, 70% probability. So I'm not promising you this is correct. 70% probability that 20 years from now, no more physical keys. Of course, we still need to control access to things. Most people know that uh, if you've bought a car anytime in the last few years, generally speaking, they come with some kind of electronic access, a fob of some sort, which you, in this case, in this picture is being used to sort of manually open the car, but generally doesn't even require that. You just keep it on your person. It detects that the, the fob is nearby and it allows you in. I would argue this is the elimination of a physical key. More than 80% of vehicles today that are manufactured use some kind of electronic key fob, according to the BBC. And I fully predict that with respect to vehicles that will go to 100% within the next few years, long before the 20 year time horizon we're talking about today. But it's not just uh, uh, electronic fobs. Many cars today also allow you to unlock them with your smartphone. Certainly uh, businesses like um, uh, a Zipcar are entirely reliant on this ability for you to rent a car and unlock it with your smartphone. And I think that in addition to fobs, you will increasingly be able to use your smartphone as well across not just an occasional model of car, but across all cars. And you won't even need a fob if you would rather not carry one with you. Beyond vehicles, we see today that many hotel chains are in the process of enabling smart locks across almost all of the rooms. Merritt and Hilton had both committed to have it done before the end of 2020. I don't know for sure if they've 100% completed those projects, but essentially the vast majority of hotel rooms, certainly here in the United States and in other technically advanced countries, will allow you to open your hotel room with your phone without necessarily needing to have any kind of physical key, even a card physical key, but to be able to simply use 
your phone, saving you even the need to go to the front desk and check in. You can check in in advance and simply get to the hotel and go right to your room, which of course is an example of hyper convenience. And beyond hotel rooms, more and more homes are being enabled with smart locks as part of a broader trend to move towards smart homes. This is not an overnight change. Of course, people don't necessarily run out and redo the locks on their homes unless they have a good reason, but it's already happening. I do have smart locks on my home, for example, and those create many conveniences, such as the ability to give a temporary code to somebody who has to come to work in your house or deliver a package, the ability to keep a record of who comes and who goes at what time, and again, the ability to open your door with either a code and or a phone and not have to remember to carry something around in your pocket that's going to jangle and you know possibly uh, uh, get caught up with things in your pocket and all that kind of stuff. So that was number 10, the elimination of keys, physical keys. So what else? Uh, I'm getting ready to do part two. Hopefully you've enjoyed part one. I would love to hear if you totally disagree with me on any of these items. By all means, put your notes in the comments and also let me know if there's anything that you strongly believe belongs in part two. I'm still finishing up part two and I would love to hear your thoughts. You might surprise me with a couple of insights I hadn't thought of. As always, thanks so much for watching and listening to the Winning Digital Customers podcast. I'm Howard Tierski. I hope you're not too, too broken up about some of the things that I'm telling you are going away. You know what? If you want, you can keep a parking meter. I think you're going to be able to get them really cheap. When they tore down uh, the old Giant Stadium, some people kept uh, you know uh, seats, bleachers from Giant Stadium. If you're nostalgic about any of these things, I'm sure you can get one and keep yourself and look at it and remember the good old days. But for the rest of us, we're going to go for convenience, massive value shift, and proactive personalization. So look forward to seeing you next time. Part two, and until then, keep transforming.